You're on a hiking trip having what's supposed to be the time of your life. You and your friends are singing songs, discovering the wonders of nature, taking only memories, and leaving only footprints. Until Steve gets a little out of control. He swears he's been on this mountain path before, and he knows a great shortcut to get to the top. So the rest of you follow him up off the beaten path, and next thing you know, Maisie is knee-deep in a briar patch, Trey has lost one of his flip-flops in a boulder field, and Jordan is crying in a heap on the path, refusing to go any further. Even if you make it to the summit, nobody had fun getting there. That's because while achieving the end goal is important, the way you get to your destination matters too. It's the climb, as they say. And the same thing is true in sustainability. When we work toward sustainability goals, we have to create inclusive, strategic, and coordinated plans that ensure we're not leaving people behind. Or, you know, dragging them up a rock scramble in flip-flops. And while that might seem like a given, how we actually make those inclusive plans and get people to participate in them can be a little less clear. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. We're facing a tough hike to a more sustainable future. From climate change, to food insecurity, to systemic injustices, there are lots of challenges standing between us and a balanced world. To get up this mountain, we'll need a diverse group of people and organizations working together. When people unite to work on shared goals, it's called coordinated action, and it's a key part of sustainability. Because we can do way more together than any one of us could do on our own. And there are some principles we can use to make sure that coordinated action really works for everybody involved. Like, let's look at what's happening in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the DRC. After centuries of exploitation by white colonial powers, social structures in the DRC had a long, hard recovery. Colonial demands for natural resources, commercial agriculture, and the slave trade left the rainforests disturbed, food production in jeopardy, and many Congolese people in abject poverty. More recently, the DRC has also had to deal with volcanic activity, plus floods and drought driven by climate change, plus unjust sales of indigenous land, plus a new wave of exploitation caused by cobalt mining. Agriculture has been devastated, the rainforests are in danger, and millions of Congolese people have been left without food or clean water. So the DRC has a big hill ahead of it on its way to a sustainable future. And if we want to run up that hill, we'll have to make a deal with God and get him to swap our places. And by that, I mean we'll have to follow a process to make sure we see things from other perspectives and don't leave anybody behind in the boulder field. To make sure everybody is included, we want sustainability processes to follow three rules. First, they should include diverse voices so that all relevant communities can share their their perspectives and participate in whatever action we take. Second, processes should be integrative, making sure all those perspectives are actually factored into plans and decisions. And third, they should be normative, meaning that the changes reflect the values, needs, and goals of all those different communities. In the DRC, processes like this have helped kickstart progress toward big sustainability goals. For instance, a 2023 forum organized by the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa made sure to invite speakers representing lots of different stakeholders. Stakeholders are people who are impacted by sustainability decisions, so in the case of food sovereignty, they they include small-scale farmers, fishers, and pastoralists, and indigenous farmers and land managers. With diverse voices represented, the Alliance worked on plans that integrated all the stakeholders' ideas. Speakers at the forum expressed concerns about agricultural deforestation that threatens air quality and biodiversity, and about unsustainable farming practices that might threaten future food production. So they made sure their plans would address those issues. And in the end, they worked together to make plans that most people supported. They came up with lots of ideas, including giving farmers more money and decision-making power, creating policies that help include women and youths in agriculture, and using new technology to develop climate-resilient crop seeds. And those solutions are normative, because they take everyone's values into consideration. All that was no small feat. It can be hard to create processes like this, and even harder to get people to work together on them. I mean, let's be real, it's hard enough getting five people up a mountain together, let alone getting dozens, hundreds, or thousands of people united around sustainability. Luckily, there are four more strategies we can use to get lots of people working toward goals together. First, we can make sure our processes are context-based, or centered around a specific place and issue. This makes it easier to find problems and enact solutions because we know exactly where and what we're talking about. Like if you're just planning for any old vacation, flip-flops might seem like a great idea. But if you know it's a mountain hike with Steve, you might think differently. Secondly, we want our plans to be pluralistic, recognizing that there are multiple ways of approaching and understanding problems. Briar patches and rock scrambles might sound like fun to Steve, but Maisie, Trey, and Jordan would probably rather find an easier route. Third, processes should be goal-oriented, with stakeholders sharing a common goal. 
That one's easy. We all want to get to the top of the mountain. And fourth, we want our actions to be interactive, with people working together, learning from each other, and getting actively engaged in the hike. For an example of how those four guidelines work, let's jump over to Louisville, Kentucky. Just like the people in the DRC, Kentuckians are facing some big environmental hazards. Flooding, heat waves, and bigger storms are threatening their systems, and their goal is to create a city that can stand up to those challenges. The process started with the Louisville mayor joining the U.S. Climate Mayors Network to learn how other leaders were helping their communities. Then the local government sent surveys and scheduled public meetings where people and organizations could voice their top concerns for sustainability in the Louisville area. And by integrating people's ideas, they put together plans to reduce emissions, boost biodiversity, educate and empower locals, and build a climate-resilient city. That process had it all. Diverse voices, integration, normativity, context plurality, goal orientation, interaction, it's all set up for success. But Louisville's plans are still pretty new, so we don't know exactly how they'll shake out in the end. And like we learned in our doomed mountain hike, even processes that seem scenic and beautiful and briar patch free don't always work perfectly. Even if you have the most inclusive, thoughtful process, it can still be hard to get people to participate in it. Think of all the calls to action you might have passed on because you didn't have the time or money or because you were focused on another worthy cause. Like getting Trey to buy some hiking shoes, for goodness sake. Experts have spent tons of time analyzing why people do or don't participate in sustainability projects. Some factors are on the individual level, like whether someone thinks a problem is urgent or meaningful, or whether they have the time to chip in. Some are on the group level, like does the group have enough money or good communication? And some factors are at a society level. Is there political support and the infrastructure needed to make change happen? One key factor in participation is social capital. In communities with high social capital, people are connected and like to work together and have strong relationships that make it easier to rally behind common goals. Like maybe if Steve would pick up the phone once in a while, he could have told everyone how hard that hike would be, and they could have all made sure to wear real shoes. And social capital also builds trust within a community. That way, people know they can lean on each other when issues get tough and it reassures the Jordans of the world that they won't get left behind. But even if people want to participate in sustainability efforts, they still need to know what to actually do. The next step in strong coordinated action is figuring out how to use everyone's individual skills to get to your collective goals. Like maybe on your hike, when you finally get to the mountaintop, you and your friends see that the next peak over has been blown up by a mining operation looking for coal. So you decide you wanna do something about coal dependence in your area to protect this beautiful, treacherous mountain from meeting the same fate. So you form a coalition, you meet with lots of different different stakeholders in the area and come up with a goal that considers everyone's different values, replacing 20% of coal-generated electricity with renewable sources in the next 10 years. Now it's time for your team to put the plan into action, and the best way to do it is by playing to everybody's strengths. Like Steve grew up hiking all over these mountains, and he knows a lot about the local landscape and geography. So he and his scouting crew work on finding the best places for wind turbines, solar panels, and high-voltage transmission lines to generate and move energy with minimal impact on the ecosystem. And even though they're not the best hikers, Maisie and Trey are both in law school, so their group researches legal cases about residents exposed to coal ash and how to make the company blowing up mountaintops pay for increasing health risks in their community. And Jordan has the biggest heart in the bunch, so even though that hike was tough, he's great at connecting with people. He starts hosting info sessions and fundraisers all over the area, teaching people about the problems with coal, hearing about their concerns, and getting more people on board with the movement. And he makes sure to gather opinions from people of color, indigenous people, and people living in poverty, or with disabilities, or serious medical needs. Leaning on the knowledge and expertise people already have can make hard projects easier and let everyone involved know that they're valuable to the cause. But if you've ever done a group project in school, you know that when smart, capable people work together, it can sometimes cause conflict. Like, as part of her research, Maisie finds out that over a quarter of households in the county rely on the coal industry for their income. So slashing coal production means slashing their livelihoods too. So she starts to push back against the plan, saying they need to cut back less on coal. But Trey learned that tons of coal workers in the county are suffering from lung diseases like black lung and COPD as a direct result of their work in the coal mines, and cutting back any less will put them and future workers in even more danger. These kinds of conflicts are really common when groups try to come together to address big problems, but Jordan helps the team work together, making sure everyone's concerns are heard and helping the group come up with a new plan that addresses everyone's needs. With input from the local community, including marginalized voices, they develop a worker's training program to help coal workers transition into careers in renewable energy. And they also make plans to do things like guaranteed pensions to support people who do lose their jobs or who struggle to make ends meet because of their health. If we want to build a sustainable future, we'll have to climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow, and take some coordinated action. Meeting our goals is going to take a lot of commitment and collaboration, and it's not going to happen overnight. Climbing the mountain of sustainability is hard, especially when you have to keep worrying about Trey and his flip-flops, and stopping environmental catastrophes and addressing centuries-long injustices and fighting against powers way, way bigger than yourself.
It can be heavy work, but by using processes that make sure everyone, even the most marginalized voices, can be seen and heard, we can find an easier path to the top and make sure nobody loses their flip-flops along the way. Now, the mountains are calling, and I must go. Bye! If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite hiking experience, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.